This meeting is being recorded. Okay, thanks Eric for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to give this talk in this uh, online workshop. Uh, today I want to talk about some work we started two years ago together with Peter Gange. He is now back in Linz and Mario Gopria, who is a PhD student. And this work is now involved in our newly established research center on computational electric machine laboratory, which is a joint initiative of uh, TU Graz together with Darmstadt. Uh, the task is the direct simulation of an electric motor as a 2D model. Uh, and the basic idea behind is finally to do what is the main task of Peter Gange to do shape and topology optimization of the motor, say to minimize, for example, iron losses. And the idea here is that the motor consists of a stator, which is fixed in time. We have a rotor with some magnets, which is rotating, of course. We have the coils, and we have a thin air gap between. And uh, this work is done in, in joint cooperation with a group from uh, Bosch in, in Renning, Germany. And the idea is to apply space-time, finite and later on boundary element methods to solve this in the space-time domain. The rotation is given. Uh, and uh, yeah, to use adaptivity both in space and time to do computations in parallel and so on. And uh, the particular task here is that we have both, we have a fixed domain and we have some rotating domain. Okay. We start with the eddy current approximation of the Maxwell system. So here we neglected the time derivative of the dielectric displacements. And we have some constitutive equations. On one side, we have the magnetization inside. And then due to the uh, movement of the domain, we have here some additional term of the, elect or of the magnetic B field and some velocity vector. Uh, I use here Y to denote the Eulerian coordinates. T is a time. And for the solution of the Maxwell equation, uh, we use some vector potential answer. So we write B as a curl of A. So this equation is satisfied. Plugging this in into this equation, we end up that we can write as an electric field E as a time derivative of the vector potential. Uh, using the relativity, we can then write the magnetic H field in this way. And we end up with a well-known curl-curl equation uh, with an additional time derivative here. And this, okay, sorry for this interruption. So we are dealing with this uh, parabolic curl-curl equation to find the vector potential A. And as usual, we consider a two-dimensional cross-section of the electric motor using uh, a vector potential A with only the third component depending on Y1 and Y2, the velocity vector V with uh, two components. Then we can compute the, the curl in the cross product with the velocity. We obtain such a convective term. Computing once again, the curl curl equation of the vector potential, we obtain this diffusion type term. The same for the magnetization. The curl of the magnetization ends up with a third component. So at the end, we have to solve such a parabolic evolution equation uh, to find the scalar potential U with some, so this is a convective uh, derivative. So in this brackets, this is a total time derivative with some conductivity, second order diffusion term, some right hand side uh, for the impressed current and the magnetization. And of course we have to add boundary conditions. We have to add initial or periodicity conditions. And yeah, what are the problems behind? We have the stator, which is a fixed domain which models iron and coils. 
there the velocity is zero. So the time derivative here turns out to be the standard partial time derivative. Then we have the rotor, which consists again of iron, the magnets. Near to the magnets, we have some air inclusions, um, which will be handled uh, within the rotor. So there we have the, the full equation. And then there is some uh, intermediate domain, some non-conducting air domain, where we assume that this is given by a fixed annular ring domain, where the conductivity is zero. So we end up with an elliptic equation there. So we have to deal with an elliptic parabolic interface problem, where one of the subdomains, the rotor, is rotating. In the case of a fixed rotor, the BEM-FEM coupling was considered in an old paper by Rick McCavey and Manuel Zuri from the late 80s. There is some newer work based on the PhD thesis of Robert Shaw from Darmstadt. And in the first part, I will focus on a pure space-time finite element approach to solve this problem. And in the second part, and this is still ongoing work, I will comment how we can use boundary element methods in particular to solve the subproblem in this air domain. So we consider the space-time domain. Why are the Eulerian coordinates? So we start in, in 3D with y in 2D plus time is 3D. We consider this deformation as in, say, in, in elasticity. And for each time t, this defines a domain omega of t. We have for t equals 0, we have some reference domain omega with the Lagrangian coordinates x. And we consider t in a finite time interval. Then we consider some, or this describes a trajectory. We consider the time derivative, which defines the velocity there. And um, we assume that we are volume preserving, which means that the divergence of this velocity disappears. Then we introduce the total time derivative, and we can write the equation to be solved in this way using the total time derivative here. The, the main idea of, of this approach is how we can use the proofs and, and the method in the case of a fixed domain, say for the standard heat equation. Um, and there it was important to interchange integration and time derivative. But here the integrals uh, depend on time. The domain of integration depends on time. So we have to apply a Reynolds transport theory in some sense. And this is, or what is needed for this is really to rely on the rotation of the domain, as we will see later on. So in the state of first, we have no deformation, so velocity is zero. This is trivial. Now to describe the rotor, we introduce polar coordinates in the plane. And we describe this for a, a point x with radius r and, and angle of phi um, as phi plus alpha t. And alpha describes the velocity. So we just compute the velocity, which is alpha times minus y2, y1. So this is quite standard. But with this, we can now write a Reynolds transport theorem for this function plugging in this total time derivative here, or this term here, with u and the velocity, uh, taking the derivatives of this divergence, uh, we can write this in this way. And now we use that the divergence of the velocity is 0. And what remains is, in fact, the total time derivative here. So we can use, as in the case of a fixed domain, we can use Reynolds transport theorem to exchange the order of differentiation in time, total time derivative, and integration over a domain which is time dependent. So this becomes important when proving an instability constant. So now we consider our rational formulation. 
in a Bosnian space setting. So we multiply the PDE with some test functions they set, uh, integrate both in space and time, and do integration by parts only in, time, uh, in space. So we end up with this bilinear form. And what are the underlying spaces X for U and the test space Y? So we start with Y. So we have to request that the spatial gradient is square integrable in space and in time, which means using zero boundary conditions for simplicity, uh, this test function is in this space. Then taking a look on the unknown U, we see that U should be, of course, also in Y. But the total time derivative multiplied by sigma. And here at this time, it doesn't matter whether sigma is zero or not. So this may also include uh, the non-contacting region. We assume that this time derivative is in the dual of the test space. And in addition, we assume either initial conditions on the region where the domain is conducting, where we have some time derivative. Or we may replace some period periodicity condition that u not is equals u at the final time. What are the related norms? We use the energy norms. So this is weighted by the relativity gradient z, the y norm. And in x, we use a graph norm. We request that u is in y and that the time derivative is, is in the dual. But this derivative we can express by the solution w u satisfying this equation. So this is quite standard. And with this, we can now write down the bilinear form in this way. Uh, we can replace this time derivative by the solution w. And with this, we can show that the bilinear form is bounded with square root of two. We can write in order to prove in substability condition, we consider the argument u plus w u, which is an element of the test space y. We can write this in this way, uh, plug or write this in, in uh, those parts. And now we, at one time here, we use the definition of W. And here we use also the definition of W to get once again this term. So this term shows up twice. Uh, this comes from here. And if we can neglect this term, we are done. So we have this, this is norm. And this is positive U. And here important is, that we can write this additional time uh, with a time derivative. And now we can exchange the time derivative. So sigma is assumed to be at least piecewise constant. So we can exchange the order. And then we can integrate. And we see that this becomes non-negative as required. OK. This is also true by the triangle inequality, Hölder's inequality, we get another square root of two. So altogether, we can write down this inequality, uh, write this in this way. So we have an in sub stability condition. And just using this total time derivative, this version of Reynolds transport theorem, this proves follows completely the approach in the case of a parabolic, say, heat equation in a fixed domain. So now it turns out that subjectivity, which is still missing to ensure your solvability of this problem, is a bit more tricky. And uh, similar as in the case of a fixed domain, uh, we can define for a given set in Y, we can define a particular solution U tilde in the case where we have uh, conductivity, just by integrating uh, in time. So this is satisfies this equation. And of course, for t equals 0, u tilde is 0. So this is an element in, in x. To define uh, this u in the air domain, 
we consider once again, as this diffusion equation with set as a right hand side, satisfying Dirichlet boundary conditions to ensure uh, continuity across the subdomain boundaries. With this, we can write down the bilinear form in this way. Uh, due to this relation here in the conducting area, we can replace this total time derivative by z. So this is fine. This is non-negative. Here, we see the problem. So we can write z as a time derivative of u tilde. But in the case of a fixed domain, we can exchange the spatial gradient and the total time derivative, which is not so obvious in this case due to the fact that y is time dependent. Time dependent. And then we have this additional term due to the air domain. Okay. So the main question now is what, what to do with this term. And here it's important that we are considering a rotating domain. So first, let's start with the stator. So here we can exchange integration and, and time derivative, and we see that this term is non-negative. So what about the total time derivative in the rotor domain? So I will just show you those computations, uh, which are somehow technical, but, but uh, not surprising. So we just write down um, the definition of the total time derivative. We plug in the definition of the velocity with the components alpha minus alpha y2 and alpha y1 and take the partial derivative with respect to y1. So you compute these terms, compute, they go on and you obtain this expression. You do the same for the second partial derivative with respect to y2. And then you plug in these expressions into the dot product as it appears in the integrand. This is just the definition. And we plug in this result and combine. And we see that these terms here and here cancel out. So in fact, what remains is what we really need to have that in the case of a rotating subdomain, we can exchange the spatial gradient and the total time derivative. And with this, we are finally done. We can do as we did in, in the standard case. So we have this one. Now, to deal with the air domain, and we have heard about stackloff poingaré operators uh, in the talk before. Here we have the standard bilinear form for the Laplacian for the diffusion equation. So we can use Green's first formula. We have the right hand side. So this set is a test function, but this is also the right hand side. So we obtain z squared. And here we have the flux across the boundary of the air domain, which we can write by using the Stackloff Poingaré operator. But this Stackloff Poingaré operator is defined with respect to some fixed domain. So this is time independent. On the other hand, it's self adjoint, it's semi elliptic, so we have the constant kernels. So we can factorize this. So we can write this in this way. And this utility comes from the definition from the contacting regions, which is either fixed in time or which is rotating. So we can write this once again as a, uh, or we can write that as a time derivative of u tilde. Uh, so we can write this one and we are done. Okay. So finally, we have this uh, estimate, which ensures social activity. So we have boundedness in substability, social activity, and by the Babushka. Uh, Prezi theorem, as this gives us unique solvability. Uh, what was still open is, and this is from a practical point, maybe more, more interesting, is how to deal with periodicity. 
when the rotor is, is running and, and so compute just one rotation. And here's the trick is that we define this utility as a solution of such a evolution equation with some zero order term. Since this gives us the opportunity to write down the solution with some initial data. And at that time, we now can request periodicity of utility. So we have to ensure that utility is in X, which covers periodicity. So from the periodicity condition, we then can write down this way. And uh, for positive time, we can solve for the initial condition, which only depends on the given set and integrated uh, over time. So we can ensure, and, and all the other terms uh, remain the same. Okay, so we can write down this term uh, and obtain these expressions and, and this uh, follows as in the previous case. So we have Unix solvability of this covered problem. And now we may go on for discretization. So as in the standard case, we considered the most simple case that we choose finite element spaces in the space-time domain, say of piecewise linear continuous spaces functions, which are zero on the Dirichlet boundary. boundary. In the case of the initial condition, they are zero at the initial time, and which are defined accordingly uh, in the case of periodicity. There we have to ensure that at the initial time and at the final time, we have the same mesh to define this uh, accordingly. Uh, they should be conforming in X and Y. Remember, we use this norm in X using the solution WU of such a quasi-static Dirichlet boundary value problem written here, where the right-hand side was just the time derivative of U. Now we replace this by some approximate solution using the same finite element space as above, uh, using for any continuous U, later on this will be some finite element solution, uh, a WH. And we define some discrete norm, which is obviously bounded above by the continuous one, but the opposite direction doesn't hold in general. And with respect to this norm, you can proceed as before. We can show such a discrete instability condition with respect to this norm. And from this, uh, we can do all, we obtain Unix solvability, we have CS lemma, we can write down a priori error estimates and so on. Okay, now some examples, some results. So this is a space-time mesh of such, of this model you have seen at the beginning. This consists of almost 2 million space-time elements, so these are tetrahedra. Uh, the outer boundary is fixed and uh, the rotor is, is rotating here with the magnets, the coils are fixed too. And here we have a very thin air gap, which has to be resolved by small elements. So, and, and this makes it interesting to use later on boundary elements to solve this. Okay, here are some, some results here. Again, uh, it's just the model with uh, the coils, the stator, the magnets, the rotor, and this is uh, the solution U. And uh, we can go on. Time. Run. As it should be. So this is a 90 degrees rotation. So to summarize, at this point, we have described a space-time finite element discretization of such an elliptic parabolic interface problem. And using space-time FEM, we have to mesh, oh, we have to mesh the stator, we have to mesh the rotor, and we have to mesh the air domain, which is very thin, where we need to have a lot of elements. 
On the other hand, we have to solve some potential or diffusion equation. In the simplest case, it's just the Laplace equation in this air domain, where in fact the solution there is not of interest at all. So we may think to use a non-symmetric, or you can even think about symmetric BMFM coupling for this approach. And it turns out that when doing the analysis we have seen for the analysis of this elliptic problem, that the ellipticity of the spatial bilinear form is given. And this can be used to prove in sub for the evolution equation. On the other hand, and I will recall this in the second part, we know that we can prove stability of the non-symmetric BEMFEM coupling using the bilinear form from the spatial domain, also uh, in the evolution equation case, and properties of the boundary indical operators. So at this time, I will restrict so the free space transmission problem to give you the, the main ideas. So this goes back to some work we did almost 10 years ago. Um, how we can prove stability of this non-symmetric BEMFEM coupling. And as a model problem here, we consider this free space transmission problem. So with a Laplace equation in the exterior and with some diffusion equation in the interior. So you may think of the relativity and the scalar potential U, some right-hand side. We assume that the matrix A is symmetric positive definite. And of course, we have related interface conditions as in our model. And in this case, we have radiation condition. Uh, you can replace this also by considering really a boundary value problem uh, and not a free space problem. And we can write down the representation formula in the exterior using the single layer potential, the double layer potential. And to ensure that in the 2D case, and we, here we are in the spatially 2D case, uh, to ensure this uh, far field radiation condition, we need to uh, assumes the scaling condition that the integral over the flux over the normal derivative is equal to zero. Okay. For this, we can write down now the boundary integral equation with the single layer integral operator. We are in 2D, so we have the logarithmic fundamental solution uh, due to the exterior problem minus one half and the double layer integral operator. So we write down the rational formulation for the interior finite element domain, where we have here the, the Neumann trace from the interior domain. This is replaced by the flux from the boundary element part. Again, we, have, we can plug in the test function V equals one. So this term disappears. So we have, as for the Neumann problem, the solvability condition due to the scaling condition in the exterior. This gives us that the integral over the volume density F has to be zero. Okay. To cover this in a right way, we introduce this natural density as a solution of the integral equation with the right hand side one with the constants. Uh, we can rewrite this in an appropriate way and uh, can obtain, so this F constant is zero. So we obtain that the interior solution on the boundary has to be orthogonal to this natural density. So this is somehow technical and not so important for what follows. So these are the, the properties. Okay. So now we can split ui as a constant plus a function uh, satisfying this orthogonality constraint, and we can compute u0, uh, which is just zero in the two-dimensional case. So this uh, also covers the 3D case. So now 
the coupled variation of formulation is standard one, the domain bilinear form with A. This is a stabilization term requesting this orthogonality. This is the term from the coupling, and this is a boundary integral equation for the exterior problem. U0 is zero in the two-dimensional case. So to prove that this variation of formulation is uh, well formulated and allows a unit solution, we may follow the well-known work by Pretzi Johnson and, and Johnson Nedelec in the late 70s. We may multiply the integral equation by two so that this identity and this term cancels out. And then we obtain that this is nice, this is positive definite. The single layer integral operator is nice. So we have to deal here with a double layer integral operator. Uh, and if we restrict ourselves to a smooth interface, we know that this is compact. So we can uh, formulate Garding's inequality and we are done. So in the case of a smooth interface, and, and you can think that if we have some freedom, we can design the interface in such a way, we are done. So what about the, the general situation? Or let us now consider the, the Boundary element, finite element discretization, say using piecewise linears for the potential U, piecewise constants for the flux T, we end up with this equation. UI are the interior degrees of freedom from the FEM part. UC are the potentials on the coupling interface. And T are the fluxes. And what we can do is we can eliminate both the interior degrees of freedom ui and the fluxes. And we end up with two sure complements, discrete sure complements, namely the finite element sure complement in this form, which is symmetric positive definite, uh, positive semi-definite due to the properties of the finite element bilinear form. And here we have the so-called non-symmetric boundary element representation of the stack of Poincaré operator. Uh, of course, you can use the symmetric formulation. Then also the boundary element part uh, becomes symmetric, positive, semi-definite, similar as the FEM part in you are done. Uh, but then you have to deal with the hypersingular integral operator, which you can do using uh, integration by parts. So this can be done. but the system somehow blows up. So the aim is to use non-symmetric coupling using this formulation. And there is also some, some old result uh, going back to Wendland in the late 80s that if we do the discretization of the integral equation on some refined mesh, we can always ensure ellipticity of this uh, BEM approximation operator. And in most cases, and, and I think this was discussed also in Sylvia's talk before, uh, you have a certain constant C0. In most cases, one over two is sufficient to do this. But we want to do this without such a condition. So once again, we consider this coupled version of formulation and uh, it was never reported uh, that this non-symmetric formulation become instable. And Francisco gave at, at Mayflat 2009 a nice talk uh, reporting on, on his approach, which later appeared in, in Xenome and, and later on in Siam Reviews on the stability of this non-symmetric coupling for any combination of ansatz spaces, both for FEM and, and BEM. And the main idea is yeah, and I published this result. So I presented two different proofs. One was similar as that of, of Francisco. The other one used yeah, reformulation of the arguments. So we can formulate such a result that this coupled bilinear form 
is indeed elliptic in H1 for the potential U in the domain and for the flux T living in H minus one half under some assumption. So with some constant and this constant becomes zero. The question is, and uh, I have seen uh, Matteo Ferrari in the, in the audience, you can improve those estimates uh, by taking several convex combinations of these equations. Uh, and this result, I will comment on the, on the proof soon, uh, gives us a sufficient condition that we can ensure ellipticity and therefore stability. It does not say if this condition is not satisfied uh, that we don't have stability. And I think there are other ways around to, to prove the stability. So what is the, the main idea behind? First of all, we, we split a function in the H1 domain or H1 omega space. Uh, we take the trace on the boundary and consider its harmonic extension satisfying the Laplace equations there with Dirichlet boundary conditions. And with this, we can split up the domain bilinear form in this way. So this is just minimal eigenvalue of the diffusion matrix and now comes the orthogonal splitting. And what is important is this part of the harmonic extension, which is used to bound those parts coming from the boundary element formulation. Okay, so this we can rewrite uh, by the normal derivative and we can introduce once again the stackle of Poincaré operator. Then we use this contraction property of the double layer integral operator in the right energy space, which in this case is H1 half, using a suitable norm, which is This meeting is being recorded. So sorry for, for that. Uh, so we were discussing this contraction property of the shift to double layer integral operator in H1 half using a suitable norm, which is induced by the uh, inverse single layer integral operator. And in fact, there is some, some review paper by Martin Kostabel from 2007, uh, who shows that this estimate is indeed related to the ratio of the difference and the sum of the interior and exterior Dirichlet energies. So these are well known, known results. And in the most simplest case, CK is one half in the case of a circle, but CK can go to one in case that the domain degenerates. Okay, so C naught is a const, uh, the product of the ellipticity constants. It doesn't matter. And with this, we can bound the steckloff Poincaré is a bilinear form of the steckloff Poincaré operator uh, in this way. Okay, and with this, uh, we, we can go through this is uh, more or less straightforward. We can estimate this in this way. Um, we can estimate the steckloff Poincaré operator in these terms. Uh, using Young's inequality with a certain choice of the involved uh, parameters and we are done. Okay, so all estimates are sharp as shown by, by these examples. So here we have an analytic uh, curve of this constant CK or of the minimal eigenvalue. And uh, they almost uh, are zero. So there are some points uh, so alpha is the, the diffusion coefficient uh, where ellipticity fails. So for the circle, we have CK 0.5. Uh, in the case of a square, CK is something like 0.73. For an L shape, this is 0.8. And what is of particular interest and, and uh, one can do some analysis. So in, in the case of our electric motor, we have this ring domain. 
And you can even compute this minimal eigenvalue or this uh, contraction constant in the case of a ring domain, which depends on the ratio between the interior and the exterior radii. And as the radii uh, become equal, this constant goes to one again. So you can, can write down this in an explicit way. Okay, to summarize, we have discussed a space-time finite element method for parabolic elliptic interface problems. So it's straightforward, and, and we did this together with, with Mario Gopriel. We can include nonlinear material behavior uh, in the rotor, uh, in the magnets, and so on. Um, we can compute the torque. We can compute the iron losses. can compare this with, with standard approaches, time-stepping schemes. And uh, with, in our uh, CRC, Peter Gangel is working on shape and topology optimization of such an electric motor. Of course, one problem is that we have to solve the overall system. So we have a spatial discretization and we have a discretization in time. So we have to use parallel computers and we need to use appropriate preconditioning techniques. There are several methods around. Uh, one approach is just to use domain decomposition in the space-time domain. So you can decompose the space-time cylinder in subdomains and solve them separately. Uh, of course, we can include a posterior error estimators, adaptivity. I will come back to this in, in a second. And what is the next step is, as I said, to use boundary element methods to solve the elliptic equation in the air gap. Since at the moment, we have to mesh the overall motor. This can be done. So we have a 2D spatial domain. Time is a third a direction. So we can even apply standard meshing tools, which are available in 3D FEM. We have uh, also a uh, tools in 40 meshing tools for uh, moving domains. This is, is quite clear. Um, but using the BEM simplifies a lot. Since we can mesh the state which is fixed and can extend this in time. And then we can mesh the rotor. And then we can rotate this mesh. And, and both meshes are not connected to each other, but we can use a boundary element method in a space-time setting. So we are, we are not solving the boundary element method at certain time steps, but in the space-time setting, which means we use an approximation which lives on the lateral boundary, say so using piecewise constants approximations, but using uh, the Laplacian fundamental solution. And I think this, this is, is quite challenging, quite interesting. Uh, OK, we can extend this to, to Maxwell in, in, in 3D. We have some preliminary work of this. There are applications, shape optimization, optimal control, inverse problems. But there is another interesting approach, uh, which gives you maybe also some hints for the solution. We, we can formulate an abstract operator equation in the least square setting. There are works which are related uh, by Rob Stevenson. Uh, there is a new preprint uh, of Rob uh, with Wolfgang Dahm. So we are using least squares, not first order least squares, on, but least squares for an operator equation. And if you do this in the right way, you include an adjoint variable which can serve as an error estimator, as an error indicator to drive an adaptive scheme. Uh, you can even think, so we did this for, for heat equation, for wave equation. You can even think to do this, uh, so even Stokes fits into to this concept. And for the solution, since we had this discussion before, this also becomes uh, interesting, since in all of these cases, we end up with an elliptic system. Even we are solving 
heat equation, wave equation, or whatever, we end up with a block system where we need to have preconditioners for symmetric positive definite matrices. And I think that this is quite interesting. And yeah, I end up with the announcement for our annual workshops. Next one takes place uh, late September next year. I'm sorry for those interruptions, but I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer some questions. Thanks.